Is this better? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, what are all of you? Yeah! Oh, all right. Are you familiar with the, the Exodus story? Yes, pretty okay. much. Pretty much? Yeah? Okay. You know, the Exodus story is our, our story. You realize that? Um, last week had baptisms. Baptism is symbolized in the Exodus story by the crossing through the Red Sea. They, they were baptized as they entered into the wilderness. There's something about that Exodus story that is very important for us to hold on to because it is actually the framework that we need to remember in order to know and understand our own walk with God. Yes. You see, there was a conflict with Pharaoh, the god of this world. Yes. And the Passover lamb was slain to, to, to release them from his, his grip. But then they had to enter on a journey to the promised land, right? And that journey through the promised land, they entered into something that we, you experienced last week, which was the first baptism, which is the baptism of water. They were baptized in the Red Sea. But do you realize that after they crossed that Red Sea, they entered a second baptism? They entered a baptism of fire because they lived for 40 years under the cloud and under the pillar of fire. Yes. You realize in the New Testament it says we're baptized in water and fire. Amen. That's what that means. We're baptized in the word, in, in the water, but we're also baptized in the spirit. But that Exodus story instructs us about a lot of different things. You, you realize that in that journey that they went through, they, they, they came out of bondage. They became free men. They stood on the other shore and they sang this song of celebration as they looked at Pharaoh's body and the bodies of all of his army bobbing in the water, dead. Meaning that the enemy had no more grip on their life. They were entirely free. They stood as free men. You realize that when you enter into Christ, you are a free man or woman. You no longer have the enemy who has a grip on your life. Thank you, Lord. But they stood there on the shore as free men. But God said, I don't want you to be free men. You ever thought of that? God did not want them to be free. Because if you are free, what does that mean? You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. There's a hey man and a preacher. Yes, you got it. God did not want free men. You realize that when they walked up to Mount Sinai and they gathered the 12 tribes around Mount Sinai, do you know what was happening in that moment? They were entering into a covenant. But they were doing more than just entering into a covenant. You see, there's this, uh, there's this passage in Deuteronomy where it talks about slaves who become free. And if, if a slave became free, he end, back then slavery was a form of employment. It just, it's, it's how they did things back then. And so if you had a job, you were a slave. And so when a slave finished his term, seven years or whatever, but he didn't want to leave the house that he served, the master, he would go to the master and say, I love working here. I love being, you take care of me. I'd like to be your slave forever. The master as a sign to the community would take the ear of the servant, go to the post, and he would do this in front of the community. And he would take a, like a, a pick or a, an awl, you know, some people don't know what an awl is, it's like an ice pick, and he would just drive a hole 
through his ear. It pierced his ear. And in that moment, the slave became what was known as a bond slave. When Israel gathered around Mount Sinai and they entered into this thing where they received the law, they received the Ten Commandments, what was happening in that moment is that they were becoming the bond slaves of God. Because God did not want free men. He wanted people who were slaves. But what type of slaves? In Ex Exodus um, 19, it says this. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and, to, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Right? This is Mount Sinai. They just celebrated these bobbing dead bodies in the water. They're enemy. And how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Do you realize that God at Mount Sinai turned Israel, who had just been released from bondage and slavery that was grinding them down. They were crying out under the burden of uh, a slavery that killed them. And God says, I and turning you into my treasured possession. That, that phrase, treasured possession, speaks of the care of a father for a child. A love that says, you are mine. You realize that what you own, you protect. Right? What you own, you take care of. A father provides for his child. A father takes care of those that he has fathered. In that moment, God was saying, the journey ahead of you is going to be hard. And if you walk from Mount Sinai into the desert as free men, you're going to die. You're, you, you, you might make it, but I know the desert. I know the journey ahead. It's going to be hard. And if you go on your own without me, without my provision, without my protection, you won't make it. See, at the cross, Jesus did something. He released all mankind from the grip of Satan. You realize that? He released everyone. Even your neighbor who doesn't go to church. He released them all from the grip of Satan. But a lot of people choose to walk through the desert on their own. Yes. And they can't make it. That's right. They cannot make it through the desert on their own. Amen. They need to become God's slave. Yes. They need to become the bond slave of God. They need to become his treasured possession. You see... That's the secret to the, the life that we walk with God. When you belong to Him as someone who's cherished, you have no fears. You have manna to provide for your every daily sustenance. You have the spring of water that comes from the midst of a rock. You have, you realize that the pillar of, of, of cloud and the pillar of fire was not just some cute thing that God decided to do. It was a practical thing. You guys live in a desert here. You understand what I'm going to say. At nighttime, a desert is freezing cold. I mean, what was God in the midst of the desert? A pillar of fire at night. Why? He was their campfire. God was their campfire in the desert. And in the day, 
How hot is a desert? Uh, very hot. <laughs> a pillar of cloud during the day. Why? Shade. How, how does God express the fact that you are his treasured possession? It's little things like that. Amen. See, God says, you made a covenant with me. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. Amen. You belong to me. Amen. And then you go on a journey with him. And he takes you through the desert. But there's something that happened at Mount Sinai that was very important. And it's part of this covenant. Becoming a, a bond slave of God. In... Um, You know, I didn't give you the scripture. It's in uh, Exodus 20. It's the Ten Commandments. If you could bring that up on the screen, it'll be easier to be reading from the Bible than I've got in front of me. Exodus 19, or 20. Just bring it and we'll scroll through if you could do that. Maybe it will. You know what happened? I'll, I'll, this is a little aside while she's doing this. I had a whole set of sermon notes and everything ready for here, and I left it at home. <laughs> and, go, and, and, and I get to like Manning, uh, Manning Park, and I, I look at Rita and I say, my laptop and my sermon notes are at home. <laughs> and from there to Caribbean, we're saying, okay, God, what are you asking us to do? So God is saying, I'm going to give you the message in the moment. This is what's happening. So I have no notes in front of me. This is just God speaking through me. But the Ten Commandments, you shall not bow down to them, serve them. Uh, here, you, verse 7. Verse 7 is a key to what was happening in Mount Sinai. It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You ever heard someone say, have you, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And usually it's referring to someone cursing and using God's name in a way that is inappropriate. Do you realize that that's not what taking the Lord's name in vain means? Do you know, see, you have to under, understand the Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, uh, the word take actually means to hold up or bear. Meaning, I allow the name of the Lord to be placed upon me as a mark. I wear, I bear, I wear the name of the Lord. You see, Aaron, uh, in his, he, he, he was a high priest, right? And in his uh, garments, there was a, a turban that he wore, and on the turban there was this gold medallion. And that gold medallion had this inscribed on it. It said, holy, belonging to Yahweh. He had the name of Yahweh on his forehead. At Mount Sinai, all of Israel received the name Yahweh as the mark that God placed upon them. Which means that when they walked among the nations, they bore his name. And if they walked in a way that didn't reflect the God that they walked with, they bore his name in vain. Amen. Sometimes we bear his name in vain. That's right. <laughs> Sometimes when we live our life in a way that isn't in alignment with the goodness, the holiness, the righteousness, and the justice of God. You see, bearing his name was more important than anything else because uh, you remember that previous scripture that we read, read in the previous chapter? It said, I will make, for you, make you into a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That phrase is repeated in the New Testament, isn't it? God repeats it and he says, you, my believers, are a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. You see, 
the reason I'm talking about the Exodus story is because the Exodus story is our story. In fact, the key to understanding the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation is really the Exodus story being retold for Christians. You may not have no, not have noticed that before, but I'll give you a couple of clues. So for example, <coughs> there's seven letters that go out to the churches. Those seven letters are a call to the churches to go on a journey with God through the desert into the promised land. It's a call from God saying, trust me, come with me, go on a journey with me. And if you persist, you know, each letter says, if you persist, you will achieve. Promise. Then you have the, um, uh, the conflict between the God of this world, Pharaoh, who is referred to as the beast or the, uh, the Antichrist. There's the conflict with the God of this world. And, and, and here's another thing to remember about uh, Revelation. Revelation is not linear. Revelation is simply a story being told over and over and over from a lot of different angles. And so it's not chronological, which means that every single scene within the book of Revelation is telling the same story, but maybe doing a close-up shot of one aspect of it. it. Let's say that I had a statue here in front of me, and I took my camera, and I, I took a photo of the, the face of the statue, and then I took a, a, a shot of the arm, and maybe in the other arm it's, it's holding a sword, and so I take a picture of the sword, and, and maybe I do a, uh, a distance shot where I see it in the midst of this room. And I show you all of these different photos, and you say, what do these have to do with one another? But if I t explain how they all relate to the same statue, you say, ah, oh, I get it. This is what Revelation is doing, is telling the same story, the story of our journey with God through the desert to the promised land from different angles and different, different facets. And so you have this conflict with Pharaoh. You have uh, the uh, trumpet blasts, the seven trumpets of, of Revelation. You know what that is? That's when, they got, when Israel got to the end of their journey and they walked around Jericho and they blasted the trumpet seven times to bring down the kingdom of this world that was keeping them from the final step of going into the promised land. The, the bowls of judgment are like the plagues that God poured out on Pharaoh and his kingdom to destroy it, to release them from slavery. Um, the, uh, you ever wonder about that uh, last part of the, the book where it has this big, huge cube descending out of God and it calls the, the New Jerusalem? Do you know what that is? That is symbolically, and, and, and it has to be symbolic because if you look at the dimensions, like a, a city that is a cube that's 1,500 miles each direction, it's a physical impossibility for that type of a city to descend upon a world and land. The interpretive key is that that passage begins by saying, I saw the new Jerusalem descending as a bride prepared for her husband. But the reason why a cube is used is because in the desert, what was given to them? They, they were given the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is designed in a certain way that it was also reflected in the temple. But in the tabernacle and in the temple, there's one area in that temple and tabernacle that was a cube. It was the Holy of Holies. Which means that you and I are the new Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. Where the presence of God rests. And we, as the new Holy of Holies, will come as a bride prepared for her husband and become the new habitation of the presence of God upon the earth. You see, if you see and understand these things, then you can read Revelation in a new way. It's the story 
of the new Israel. Yeah. You. It's, a, it's, a, it's the exodus of the new Israel. Yeah. And in Revelation 7, there's a passage that talks about what I was just talking about, about Sinai. It says this. So just remember, this passage is, re is reflected, it, it, it's, it's talking about that gathering of the 12 tribes around Mount Sinai to become bond slaves of God and become pierced in the ear and to take up his name. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Then it goes through all of the tribes. It says 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Now, a lot of people interpret this as Israel. But if we understand that Revelation was written by the Apostle John as the exodus of the new Israel, then we have to say, maybe this isn't referring to Israel, this is referring to us. How could these tribe names be referring to us? Well, if you take a look at the order in which these are given, these this is the only time in which this order of the tribes is listed. Every time that the 12 tribes is listed, it goes through the lineage of the tribes of Israel, and it lists them according to the order of their mothers. So it starts with Leah's children, then it goes to Rachel's children, then it goes to Bildad's and Zilpah's. I think that's their names. I may get that wrong. <laughs> they, these names are hard <laughs> for a preacher, you know. Um, but it goes in that order. Well, that's not the order that this is in. In fact, it takes Judah, and it takes Judah, and it puts him to the, to the front. Why? Because Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And so Judah is the leader, the firstborn among many. Jesus is the firstborn. He's the first fruits. And so Judah is placed as the first tribe. Because remember, this is talking about us, not Israel. Then it places Reuben second, because there was an honor in the first century of those who were Jewish Christians. And it, they retained an honor among their, their brothers because they recognized that Jesus came through Israel. But then it does something very different. There's a couple of anomalies if you notice in that list, there's one tribe that's missing, the tribe of Dan. And that's significant because there was a prophecy that uh, Dan's father gave him before Dan, uh, before uh, Jacob, which is renamed Israel, before Israel passed away, he prophesied over every one of his sons. And he said to Dan, you shall be a serpent and a viper. And what came of that, was, and, and also tr the tribe of Dan fell into idolatry and was lost. And so there came to be this understanding that the tribe of Dan was lost because of their idolatry. But then in the New Testament, there was this, un, uh, or in the New Testament era, the Jewish 
people believed that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Jan Dan. And so the Apostle John specifically omits Dan, but he also does it for another reason. Why? Because there was another one that was lost, wasn't there? Judas, among the twelve. And you see, in that order, we don't have the name Joseph, and, and we, what we have, and Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now typically, because Dan was lost, they would take Joseph, and they would remove Joseph from the list, and they would just use his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But in this case, we have Joseph in the list, and Manasseh, and Ephraim is, is not there. And what does that tell us? That one was lost and another was chosen to take his place. So in the order, we see this, but there's another very key part, and this is, we're, we're, I'm gonna land this place. In this order, the tribes of the natural born children are at the end of the list. And the tribes of the illegitimate and not, the, 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 the two wives that were sort of not his wives, they were his concubines, they're brought to the top of the list. And they're brought to the top of the list because what God is saying through this list is that I have grafted in those who are not the natural heirs. And I have made them and given them a place of prominence in my kingdom. You have been grafted in. You have been given a place of prominence in the kingdom. Now, in Acts chapter 15, and all the assembly fell silent. This is the Jerusalem council where uh, Paul and Barnabas have come and they've said, you know, God took us to the Gentiles. We believe that we got it right. But we just want to share this with you because, you know, up until now, we haven't gone to the Gentiles. But they say, this is what God called us to do. And he says, they related all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, saying, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. That phrase... He took from the Gentiles a people for his name. He placed a mark Praise God. upon you and I. You see, I, the reason God is having me walk through this scripture is because we're entering in a, into a season of difficulty, of tribulation. We're walking through the desert with God. We need to trust him that we have his mark upon us. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people who say, "Don't work, don't don't take the mark of the beast, don't 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 do this, don't do that." I'm, I'm telling you, church, today, don't fear that stuff. Because if you have His mark upon you, there's no there's no room left for the mark of the enemy. If you are marked with his name, it is more powerful than the name of the enemy. Yes. God. If you are marked with the name of God, nothing can touch you. Hallelujah. If you have his name, if you bear his name, if you carry his name, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Bear his name, church. Bear his name with confidence, knowing that he walks with you through the desert. That he walks with you. That when it's hot, he gives you shade. When it's cold, he gives you warmth. When you're hungry, he provides something to eat. When you are thirsty, he quenches. But also know this, that walking through the desert requires that you walk under the fire of God. You may enter the desert through the baptism of water, but you walk through the desert with the baptism of fire. Which means that you are the Shekinah presence of, you are the temple 
of the Holy Spirit, every one of you. Yes. We, but it's not every one of you individually. Do you understand? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're, I am not the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You understand that? We come together as living stones. We are built together. A body. What type of a body? We are the new Holy of Holies. Where God meets with us in the desert. Where God says, I will make you a sign to the nations. Because you bear my name. You declare me to the nations around you. And while all of them are taking the mark of the beast. You have my mark. You have my name. You have something that leaves no room for anything else. Which means that you are set apart. A holy nation. A royal priesthood. To declare my glory. In the midst of difficulty. And what does that mean? Does that mean that the desert won't be a desert? No. It means that you don't need to fear the desert. You see, the journey is long. And some may die on the journey. Not everyone who started with them ended with them. A whole generation perished in the desert. It means that even if you die in the desert, you get to return in glory and conquer and occupy the promised land. I'll stop there. But I, I want to do this right now. If you have been feeling an anxiety about the season that we're in, I want you to you understand? Numbers chapter 6, I think. The Aaron's blessing, if you can bring that up. I want to read this passage. This is what happens when you don't have notes. Numbers chapter 6, I think. Uh, yeah, there's 624. Yeah, I have the right passage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, don't worry there. Don't know my Bible. Go to verse um, 27. Here's the important part about Aaron's blessing. It says, So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. You see, every time Aaron repeated what I'm about to read and bless you, what he was doing is he was renewing the covenant that they had made at Sinai. Every time Aaron said the words that I'm about to say, what he was saying was, we as a community are remembering that we are slaves of God. We are taking his name once again upon our forehead. We are putting Yahweh over our life, which means that we are remembering that we are slaves. We are no longer free men to wander on our own. So what I'm going to invite you is that if you want to renew your covenant with God this morning, I'm going to read this, and if you want to stand because you have been feeling like maybe I have been living my life in a way that doesn't reflect His name, just stand where you are and renew your covenant with God this morning. have to be that there's anything wrong with your life. Every time Aaron spoke to the people, it was a blessing. You see, this is how God renews his covenant. It's a blessing. It's not a, it's not a judgment. Sometimes we say, oh, I messed up. God's not interested in that. He's saying, I want to bless you. 
Isn't it amazing that God renews his covenant with you in the form of a blessing? That's important. So today we, we renew our covenant with God. I, I'm standing. I'm remembering that I am a slave this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so I place the name of the Lord upon you as a sign and as a seal, as a protection from the storm that is to come as a reminder that in the midst of the desert that He is your provider, that He is your protector, that He is your Father. Amen. your blessing over this church family as we go into this week and into this season. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Hallelujah.